Okay, hi everybody. So today I want to talk about authentication done with JSON Web Tokens. I actually want to talk about API authentication in general with and without JSON Web Tokens. There has been a lot of fuss and talk about JSON Web Tokens in the last year or two. Uh, so I want to actually cover the good things and some of the best practices with them and as well as some of the security quirks they impose. So let's get straight right to it. So API authentication. How many of you here have ever built an API? Okay, almost everybody. So you probably know the gist. If you, let's say you have, uh, you're building a mobile app and you need a backend to store the data and that backend provides a RESTful API. You send out an email and a password and if that matches, the server returns an authentication code. Uh, on every subsequent request, instead of sending out the email and the password again, the client sends out the authentication code. The client actually only cares that it gets some kind of token that it can exchange back and forth with the server, while the server can store that token in various different ways. So let's start with the simplest one. Having a single authentication token per user. So if you have a scenario like that, you probably, your user's table probably looks something like this. You're storing an email, a password digest, and an authentication token. And I don't know how many of you have ever seen the gist about token-based authentication from Jose Valim. So when device kicked out token-based authentication, he made a gist saying that if you want to do API out, you can do it like this. Basically, before you save the user, you generate a random and a unique token inside the, the user's table. So <clears throat> there are a couple of problems with the single token, authentication token approach. First off is that actually naive implementations never expire them. Uh, if you never expire them, you give a large window of opportunity for an attacker if somebody loses a token. Uh, and I believe actually that a lot of Rails applications have been built using the given gist. Uh, basically the gist has more than 40 comments on it and it has more than 600 stars on GitHub. Uh, so yeah, unfortunately these kind of implementations rarely expire them. Uh, another thing that implementations like this have is that they're storing those tokens in plain text. Now, I ran into a question multiple times that isn't it the same as storing passwords in plain text? With the premise being that you can easily impersonate someone if you have their authentication token as well as if you have their passwords, their passwords, sorry. So the answer is actually not quite. So first off, passwords when compromised are difficult to change. When you see your system has been compromised, the only thing you can do is erase all of the passwords and send out an email saying, uh, hey, sorry, security breach, please re add a new password, blah, blah. Uh, so that has actually two consequences. First one is that you're gonna you lose customers from your platform. The second one is a lot of them are probably gonna set it to the same password as before. Uh, and another thing that the passwords have is that they're used across several services. So if somebody has a password shinypony123 on your application, they're probably using it also on their Gmail account and on their Facebook. Well, authentication tokens on the other hand are easy to change. If they're compromised, if you have a breach, you can erase them and the only thing that users have to do is log in again. And that's not much of a problem. Basically, I think that Gmail logs me out every 30 days or something like that. Or maybe that's a security uh, feature that I have. So uh, another thing is that they're auto-generated random and unique, which means they're not shared across several services. So your service is probably not sharing this, definitely not sharing the uh, authentication token with Gmail. So that's the difference between authentication tokens and passwords, but still, if your authentication token, if you store them in plain text and they somehow leak, let's, through, let's say through logs or through various data exports, like you export a user's table, 
uh, or somebody in your company like your customer support has read access to the database, uh, yeah, you can get in a bad position really easy. So uh, the other approach would be to store a single hashed authentication token per user. So it has the benefit that it's not storing it in plain text, which is really cool. However, this solution has one big problem, and it can't work, actually. Uh, it's basically so, if you have a browser and you log in, the server actually generates uh, a token, but it stores the digest and returns the token within the response. But then, if you're a user and you want to log in through your mobile device, you again send an email and a password, but actually the server uh, can't read the token since it's digested, so it has to generate a new one, and basically that invalidates the previous session, so that means that you can't be active on two devices at a time, so that's really bad. So there are some cases where you want to do stuff like this uh, on some banking applications, uh, but it's mostly not the case. And our third case would be that we have multiple hashed uh, authentication tokens per user. So basically that means we have to take care of uh, another authentication token stable that references users, and it's basically best of the three proposed, definitely, uh, and the safest and the most sane. So the problem this approach has is that tables like this can get quite large, which means that queries can actually get quite slow, and you have to do queries like that every time a uh, user makes an interaction. Uh, and it can be like one or two queries, depending on what you're doing. So you have to erase tokens periodically, and you, ha you have to figure out how you're going to erase them. Is it when they were last issued at, or when they were last used at, and stuff like that. So Rails actually had a session storage solution with using Active Record, but it kicked it out before hitting 4.0. Uh, the actual reason was it wasn't scalable. Uh, so, yeah, this solution has that problem. But here's an idea. How about, like, what if we don't store these tokens, like, anywhere? Uh, so, basically, we can do something similar to Rails sessions. So, <clears throat> let's talk a bit about Rails session storage. Uh, there are many implementations of it, but however, the encrypted cookie one is the default, so I'm going to explain that one. Back to our graph. We have a client sends out an email and a password. If they match, uh, the server returns a response with a set cookie header, and it sets a session ID that looks random. It looks like a random string, but it's actually a hash. So when you send out an email and a password, if they match, you on your server set in a user ID inside of the se session hash. Before you send it back, you encrypt it and sign it. And on every subsequent request, the client sends out the same string, uh, the same cookie. So basically, on your server side, what you have to do is take that cookie, verify the signature, and decrypt it. Now, once you decrypted it, you can find like a current user by using its user ID. That's pretty nice and works great for Rails and has been working great for Rails for years now. So, on our APIs, we could do something similar uh, or follow an open standard. Enter JSON Web Tokens. Uh, just before I continue, how many of you here have heard of JSON Web Tokens? Okay, awesome. And how many of you have implemented them? Okay, cool. Uh, so, <clears throat> a short explanation. JSON Web Tokens are an open standard that defines a comp compact and self-contained way uh, to securely share informa information between two parties as a JSON object. So back to our graph, usual. We have an email and a password. If they match with JSON Web Tokens, the client gets a random string back. Well, to the API consumer, it can look random, but it's actually much, much more. Uh, it stores information inside of it, and the concept is actually really similar to Rails sessions. 
Because basically what it does is that you have some data and you add a signature of that data, make the URL compact, and you've got a random looking string, a random looking token. So what that data could be is basically a JSON object that stores a user ID reference, and the token is basically generated by that data, the signature, and the signature is used so that no one tampers with that data. Uh, and you basically have a token. So if you ever see a JSON web token in the wild, uh, you're gonna notice that it always has two dots. And those two dots are the limiting three parts of the JSON web token. Those three parts are the header, the payload, and the signature. So <clears throat> the header actually, the JSON web token header, is a basic JSON object. Uh, it can have multiple uh, fields inside of it, but the most typical are two fields. The first one being denoting what the type of the token is, so JSON Web Token, and denoting what signing algorithm we're using. In this case, HMAC plus SHA-256. So how do we get from a header like this, from a JSON, to something that looks random? Well, we base64 encode that header, not encrypt, we encode it so that it's URL safe for transport. Then we have a JSON web token body or a payload. So a body actually uh, stores like the meat of the token. Whatever you would usually put inside of the session, you can put it inside of the token. Basically like what's the user ID, like the user a reference and the expiration time. Uh, again, it's a JSON object, how you get a random string, you base64 encode the body. And lastly, you need the JSON Web Token signature. Uh, so how do you generate a signature? You basically take the encoded header, add a dot, the first dot, uh, base64 encode the payload, and you perform a hex digest with a secret. Basically, JSON Web Tokens can be actually signed with using a secret, like an HMAC algorithm, or a public and private key pair using RSA. Depends on what you need to do. I'll talk about that a bit later. Uh, and you base 64 it again, you get a signature. Uh, again, I said, like, signatures are used so that no one tempers with the data that you set inside a token. And finally, a JSON Web Token can look something like this, header, payload, and signature. So, <clears throat> I saw, uh, I, uh, you saw like a body that has some key value pairs inside of it. Those are called claims, body claims, and JSON Web Tokens. There are some registered claims that JSON Web Tokens like natively support, and there are some, and you can basically put private claims like there are any, any kind of arbitrary data. So <clears throat> the body claims can, like some typical would be like the ESS claim, who the issuer of the token is. Like is a, it's probably going to be your web page or your company name. What the subject of the token is. So in this case, if we're talking about uh, authentication, it would be like login or login for the front end. Then you got an expiration uh, field. Yeah, pretty self-explanatory. It's basically denotes when the token will expire. You got a not before field, so it means that you can't use a token before a certain date uh, or date time period in time, uh, which is cool if you're doing some kind of campaigns and stuff like that, and you're sending out links up front. Uh, and it's got a field issued at which is basically like the timestamp when you issued out the token, when you created it. And the really cool thing about a couple of these claims is that if you have an expiration claim, and let's say now you want to decode that JSON web token, uh, and the expiration claim is in the past, while decoding JSON web token libraries will raise errors and notify you okay, this token has expired, you cannot use it. The same goes, goes for the not before field. Okay, so 
<clears throat> I compared actually JSON Web Tokens and Rails sessions uh, a bit before. So they both carry information inside of themselves, but they're different. Uh, first of all, Rails sessions are encrypted, while JSON Web Tokens are signed. Uh, that means that Rails sessions can't be read on the client side. And I'm not even talking about the HTTP only flag on cookies. It means basically if you want to read content from it, you have to have the encryption key, like the secret key base in Rails. Well, JSON Web Tokens on the other hand can be read on the client side and it's totally okay because one of the purposes is that it shares information with the client side app. Uh, however, if you want to put some secret information inside of JSON Web Tokens, they must be explicitly encrypted. And there's the whole JavaScript object signing and encryption standard that can be used for that. However, I would suggest uh, putting any kind of secret information ever in sessions nor in JSON Web Tokens. Okay, so both of these techniques can actually be considered like stateless authentication. Uh, why stateless authentication? Well, Basically, there are mechanisms that allow you never to put any kind of state on the server memory. So basically, when you want to log in uh, and the login is successful, you send out a response. And it doesn't matter if you're using JSON Web Tokens or Sessions. You can put stuff like in, like, here's a user ID. Uh, and then whenever it goes back, you check out the user ID, if the signature is valid, if the expiration time is okay, and pull out that user. Uh, but basically what that means is that if you take a fingerprint of the database content before the user logged in and after, they're gonna be completely the same. So <clears throat> one thing to note here is like, how, if they're not stored anywhere, how do you perform logouts? Well. Rails sessions do it in a convenient way. They basically, so they're cookie based uh, and they put on an HTTP only flag on cookies. That means that you can't tamper with them through JavaScript, uh, which means basically that you send out a delete request uh, for sessions and what Rails actually does is sends out a delete cookie command or actually a set cookie command with the expiration time in the past and it deletes uh, that that cookie session. So that's pretty cool. You can basically do the same thing with JSON Web Tokens. You can transmit them through cookies, uh, and you can put the HTTP only flag. But you can also, if you don't need it, we, you can also like store them in local storage and stuff like that. And basically, when you a user wants to log out from the front end, you just the client can erase that cookie. Uh, so that's pretty cool. However, that uh, has one big problem, and that's forced logouts. Uh, so imagine uh, on your platform there's some kind of account hijacking. Let's say somebody, a user calls in customer support and says, okay, please, uh, like somebody's in my account, and you basically want to have a button like clear all sessions and stuff like that. If you just send out the payload with the user ID, your, your hands are basically tied. Uh, you, the only thing you can do is rotate the signing or the encryption key, uh, and that will actually invalidate all of user's sessions. So that's, that's not really good. You just wanna invalidate one person's sessions. So <clears throat> let's talk about revocation. Uh, there's been a, a lot of fuss about JSON Web Tokens and revocations and how they're basically uh, impossible to do. Um, well, there are, they are actually possible, and I'm gonna show you a couple of ways. So, uh, since, since Rails uh, by default handles, the, handles their session similarly to JSON Web Tokens, one can ask, how does device actually handle this? Uh, well, device, actually what, it, what device does, it inserts a part of the user's password hash into the payload. So if you look at the session, you can see two informations. You can see a user ID that's used to pull out the user, the current user, and a part of the password hash. So when, when the user is loaded, 
device and warden can look at it if it matches. And the motivation behind it is that if the user changes their password, uh, they will be logged out from all of their devices. So that's pretty cool and pretty smart on how to build stateless authentication. And the same thing can be done in uh, JSON Web Tokens. You just put a password start in it, and that's it. I would never put a whole password in it, but if you just put a pass uh, some like 15, first 15 characters and stuff like that, uh, there are no security issues here. Uh, another thing that JSON Web Tokens have natively supported is that you can basically disable tokens with an issue that claim older than some date, like current date. What that means is that when you issue out uh, tokens, uh, you put an issue that inside a claim inside of the body, and you put on the user's table like a minimum issue that. That basically means that you can have like a sign out from all devices button. Uh, that basically what it does is fetches the user and sets the minimum issue they add to the current time. So that's pretty cool. Another thing you can do is actually have a JSON token identifier. A release tokens with that and have that JSON token identifier inside of the user's table. Basically, if you need to force log out somebody, uh, you can just rotate it or uh, delete it. So that's pretty cool. However, this has one problem, and that it has the problem that logouts, like normal logouts that users do, don't invalidate tokens. So if somebody gets somehow to your token, uh, let's say you're on a public computer or on an insecure network, logging out won't help. So that's basically the disadvantage of this approach. Uh, however, yeah, Rails with the proper security mechanisms, like if you are using TLS, if you're protecting yourself from XSS, and I mean, it's not like opt-in, you're basically already protected with Rails uh, and use HTTP only flags on cookies, this is, this is basically impossible. Uh, okay, so let's talk a bit about JSON to other JSON, token, uh, JSON web token advantages, generally over sessions and over other token-based authentication methods. So one thing that's really cool is that you can safely share data with the client app. Uh, the client can read data from the JSON web token uh, and this can be handy if you're sending extra information through that token that you want the client to read. Uh, also, it has advantage over regular token-based authentication that's just basically random strings, is that you can store any kind of da data inside of it, uh, stuff like, I don't know, shopping cart IDs and stuff like that. Uh, one thing I would advise not doing is I saw a lot of people uh, adding like permissions and stuff like that inside of JSON Web Tokens so that on the back end you don't have to fetch permissions and stuff like that. Uh, I would advise strictly against it or if you don't know what you're doing because what happens when you have tokens like this that aren't revoked uh, but the permissions have been changed. If you only read them from tokens, that's, that's basically really bad. Unless you have a system whenever you change a permission, you revoke all of the previous tokens. Uh, in that case, that can help you scale stuff a bit. A uh, <clears throat> really cool thing is that they have self-contained time-based expiration handling. Uh, okay, what does that actually mean? So basically, they have an expiration time written inside of themselves. So if you out issue out uh, token that can only last for like half an hour, uh, the hijacker can exploit that only during the, those ha that half hour. Uh, however, with sessions in Rails, it's a bit different because if somebody steals your session in Rails, they actually don't have the expiration time written in themselves. They have it on the max age cookie property, which you can basically spoof with, I don't know, using curl and stuff like that, and basically reuse the session whenever you want. Uh, 
Another cool thing, uh, and this is not much for Rails because we use sessions uh, uh, for other technologies like I know PHP has that. Uh, it offers scalability really good because I know that, that there are solutions for handling sessions where you basically have session in, me in the memory of the server. And then you basically have problems when you want to scale and have multiple servers. That means that either you have to uh, like add Redis or store that in the database or uh, you can basically uh, have sticky sessions on your load balancer and stuff like that, but that can get easily messy. Uh, a really cool thing about JSON Web Tokens and what I really like about it is that if you're building microservices and stuff like that, machine to machine information sharing uh, is enabled like by default with this. Imagine like if you have like two applications and they're communicating, let's say, through webhooks. Uh, you want to be sure that the receiving app knows that from whom it's getting the payload. What you can basically do, store the payload inside a JSON web token, use private and public key encryption, and validate that whatever payload you got is actually from someone you trust. Uh, and you don't have to, yeah, it's, it comes out of the box and it's really, really cool. Uh, another thing is the same with information sharing like this. You're not reinventing the wheel. You're not doing your own uh, public-private key crypt cryptography. You're not inventing algorithms. You're using an open standard. And that's really cool because there are a lot of languages that support JSON Web Tokens. Uh, and basically, if you, let's say, want to switch from Rails, and you want to go to use like Sinatra or Rhoda or something like that or Elixir. Uh, and you want to switch just like the part of the application or the whole application. Your, all of your sessions can still stay alive because you're using a standard uh, that's widely adopted and any kind of technology can understand it. So that's really cool. Uh, and other use cases would be like, also you can use it for single sign-on systems. Uh, okay, so I said the language support is quite wide. If you're interested in JSON Web Tokens in general and you want to find a library in a language that you're using, you can always visit jwt.io. Uh, there are libraries in Ruby, Elixir, Go, Python, Java, Rust, C Sharp, Perl, or whatever. There's a whole lot of them. Uh, there's also a couple of implementations in Rails. Uh, the most popular one is the Knockgem. So basically, it's cool. It's for APIs, uh, and it's uh, persistence agnostic. So it doesn't care uh, what kind of uh, ORM you're using, and it actually doesn't care like even what authentication system uh, you're using to like compare passwords and stuff like that. So you can use device clearance or whatever. Uh, one drawback is that it currently has no revocation techniques by itself, uh, but that's basically the reason because it doesn't have to do anything with persistence, so you have to implement it on your own. Uh, there's another gem called Device JSON Web Tokens. It's uh, not an API gem, but it's actually substituting Rails sessions for JSON Web Tokens. I think the case is when some people can't use cookies on their sites and stuff like that. Uh, however, the thing I found interesting about it is that it proposes a couple of uh, revocation techniques like blacklisting tokens and stuff like that that I didn't find time to mention. So if you're interested in that, uh, go check out the source code. And the third one I would suggest checking out, I haven't tried it, is from Jeremy Evans. Uh, it's called Rodout. Uh, the gem itself has like a gazillion of implement, uh, like uh, features, security features, uh, and I really like it. And it basically has token-based authentication uh, and JSON Web Tokens, so you can basically choose from those two. Uh, okay, in conclusion, what I want you to take from this presentation, uh, JSON Web Tokens offer a couple of stuff. First one being, uh, scalability. So, uh, yeah, I talked already about it. Uh, it can save you some lookup times in the database and similar stuff. Uh, uh, you can get rid of complexity, so you don't have to have additional processes. 
uh, so there are no cron jobs for erasing those tokens, or you don't have to add uh, a lot more complexity, like adding a Redis if you already don't have it, and stuff like that. So your stack can be simpler. Uh, and it's standardization. So multiple languages are using JSON Web Tokens. There have been security issues with uh, JSON Web Tokens in the past, but all of them have been fixed and, I mean, all of them that are known. Uh, yeah, so they have been fixed and it's really cool that they, they're they widely used. Uh, and yeah, uh, what I want you to remember from this talk, if you're already using JSON Web Tokens and by any chance didn't implement a revocation technique, please implement it because at some point you're gonna need it. Uh, I know of a company that had an incident with that and they had to like rotate their keys and log out every user. It's not a drama, but uh, there are better stuff you can do. Uh, and at the end, there is no silver bullet. Uh, you may actually have already a really good authentication system, and I don't think you should switch to JSON Web Tokens. I, however, uh, the reason why I started looking, looking at JSON Web Tokens was because I wasn't satisfied with any of the API authentication systems that are currently implemented in the Ruby and Rails world. Uh, Security-wise, some people might say that database stored tokens and database stored sessions have some advantages or like they're less vulnerable to attacks uh, when session hijacking occurs after a user has logged out. Uh, on the other hand, it's harder to leak tokens that you've actually never stored somewhere uh, and you avoid stuff like having issues with timing attacks. So uh, there are actually always gonna be uh, performance versus security trade-offs and you have to find out which one are good for your system. Basically what you can always do is never forget to enforce like SSL and secure yourself from XSS attacks because that will help you no matter what kind of authentication technique you're using. So anyways, I hope uh, I introduced to you an alternative way for token-based authentication uh, and I hope you learned something from it. Uh, before I finish off, uh, I want everybody to give a big round of applause to Jason, to the Charns family, and everybody else that helped with the conference. Yeah. The picture. I found it on Twitter last night. <laughs> yeah, so uh, I really love the venue, I love the conference, I love the speakers and the audience, and Nashville in general, so this is a great experience for me. Uh, my name is Damir Svrtan. Uh, I'm a Rails team lead at Infinum. Infinum is a software development and design agency based in Croatia, Slovenia, and with offices here in New York and San Francisco. I'm also an organizer of a local Ruby meetup group back in Croatia in Zagreb. Um, if you want to talk about this topic more, I'd love to since I haven't managed to cover like 50% of the stuff that I wanted. And uh, so thank you.